The Tomb Spawn by Clark Ashton Smith Evening had come from the desert into Farad, bringing the last stragglers of caravans. In a wine shop near the northern gate, many traveling merchants from outer lands, parched and wary, were refreshing themselves with the famed vintages of Yoros. To divert them from their fatigue, a storyteller spoke amid the clinking of the wine cups. Great was Asaru, being both king and wizard. He ruled over half the continent of Zothik. His armies were like the rolling sands, blown by the Simum. He commanded the genie of storm and of darkness, and called down the spirits of the sun. Many knew his wizardry, as the green cedars know the blasting of leaven. Half immortal, he lived from age to age, waxing in his wisdom and power till the end. The Sedon, black god of evil, prospered his every spell and enterprise, and during his latter years he was companioned by the monster Neoth Korgai, who came down to earth from an alien world, riding a fire-maned comet. Osaru, by his skill in astrology, had foreseen the coming of Neoth Korgai. Alone, he went forth into the desert to await the monster. In many lands, people saw the falling of the comet, like a sun that came down by night upon the waste. But only King Osaru beheld the arrival of Neoth Korgai. He returned in the black, moonless hours before dawn, when all men slept bringing the strange monster to his palace, and housing him in a vault beneath the throne room, which he had prepared for Neath Korgai's abode. Dwelling always thereafter in the vault, the monster remained unknown and unbeheld. It was said that he gave advice to Osaru, and instructed him in the lore of the outer planets. At certain periods of the stars, women and young warriors were sent down as a sacrifice to Neath Korgai and these never returned to give account of that which they had seen. None could surmise his aspect, but all who entered the palace heard ever in the vaults beneath the muffled noise, as of slow-beaten drums, and a regurgitation such as would be made by an underground fountain, and sometimes men heard an evil cackling as of a mad cockatrice. For many years, King Osaru was served by Neoth Korgai, and gave service to the monster in return. Then Neoth Korgai sickened with a strange malady, and men heard no more the cackling in the sunken vault, and the noises of drums and fountain mouths grew fainter and ceased. The spells of the wizard king were powerless to avert his death, but when the monster had died, Osaru surrounded his body with a double zone of enchantment, circle by circle, and closed the vault. And later, when Osaru died, the vault was opened from above, and the king's mummy was lowered therein by his slaves, to repose forever beside that which remained of Neath Korgai. Cycles have gone by since then, and Osaru is but a name on the lips of storytellers. Lost now is the palace wherein he dwelt, and the city thereabout. Some sang that it stood in Yoros, and some in the empire of Sinkor, where Yethelriam was later built by the Nimboth dynasty. And this alone is certain, that somewhere still, in the sealed tomb, the alien monster abides in death, together with King Osaru, and about them still is the inner circle of Osaru's enchantment, rendering their bodies incorruptible throughout all the decay of cities and kingdoms. And around this is another circle, guarding against all intrusion, since he who enters there by the tomb's door will die instantly, and will putrefy in the moment of death, falling to dusty corruption ere he strike the ground. Such is the legend of Osaru and Neoth Korgai. No man has ever found their tomb, but the wizard Namira, prophesying darkly, foretold many ages ago that certain travelers, passing through the desert, would some day come upon it unaware, 
and he said that these travelers, descending into the tomb by another way than the door, would behold a strange prodigy. And he spoke not concerning the nature of the prodigy, but said only that Neoth Korgai, being a creature from some far world, was obedient to alien laws in death as in life. And of that which Namira meant, no man has yet guessed the secret. The brothers Milab and Merabak, who were jewel merchants from Ustame, had listened raptly to the storyteller. Now truly, this is a strange tale, said Milab. However, as all men know, there were great wizards in the olden days, workers of deep enchantment and wonder, and also there were true prophets, and the sands of Zothik are full of lost tombs and cities. It is a good story, said Merabak, but it lacks an ending. Prithee, O teller of tales, canst thou tell us no more than this? Was there no treasure of precious metals and jewels entombed with the monster and the king? I have seen sepulchres where the dead were walled with gold ingots, and sarcophagi that poured forth rubies like the gouted blood of vampires. I relate the legend as my fathers told it, affirmed the storyteller. They who are destined to find the tomb must tell the rest, if happily they return from the finding. Milab and Merabak had traded their store of uncut jewels, of carven talismans and small jasper and carnelian idols, making a good profit in Farad. Now, laden with rosy and purple-black pearls from the southern gulfs, and the black sapphires and whiny garnets of Yoros, they were returning northward toward Tassun, with a company of other merchants, on the long, circuitous journey to Ustame by the Orient Sea. The way had led through a dying land. Now, as the caravan approached the borders of Yoros, the desert began to assume a profounder desolation. The hills were dark and lean, like recumbent mummies of giants. Dry waterways ran down to lake bottoms, leprous with salt. Billows of gray sand were driven high on the crumbling cliffs, where gentle waters had once rippled. Columns of dust arose and went by like fugitive phantoms. Over all, the sun was a monstrous ember in a charred heaven. Into this waste, which was seemingly unpeopled and void of life, the caravan went warily. Urging their camels to a swift trot in the narrow, deep-walled ravines, the merchants made ready their spears and claymores, and scanned the barren ridges with anxious eyes. For here, in hidden caves, there lurked a wild and half-bestial people, known as the Gori. Akin to the ghouls and jackals, they were eaters of carrion, and also they were anthropophagi subsisting by preference on the bodies of travelers and drinking their blood in lieu of water or wine. They were dreaded by all who had occasion to journey between Yoros and Tassun. The sun climbed to its meridian, searching with ruthless beams the nethermost umbrage of the straight, steep defiles. The fine ashlight sand was no longer stirred by any puff of wind. Now the road ran downward, following the course of some olden stream between acclivitous banks. Here, in lieu of former pools, there were pits of sand, dammed up by riffles or boulders, in which the camels floundered knee-deep. And here, without the least warning in a turn of the sinuous bed, the gully swarmed and seethed with the hideous earth-brown bodies of the gory, who appeared instantaneously on all sides, leaping wolfishly down from the rocky slopes, or flinging themselves like panthers from the high ledges. These ghoulish apparitions were unspeakably ferocious and agile, uttering no sound other than a sort of hoarse coughing and spitting, and armed only with their double rows of pointed teeth and their sickle-like talons, they poured over the caravan in a climbing wave. It seemed that there were scores of them to each man and camel. Several of the dromedaries were thrown down to earth at once, with the gory gnawing their legs and haunches and chines, or hanging dogwise at their throats. 
They and their drivers were buried from sight by the ravenous monsters, who began to devour them immediately. Boxes of jewels and bales of rich fabrics were torn open in the melee. Jasper and Onyx idols were strewn ignominiously in the dust. Pearls and rubies, unheeded, lay weltering in puddled blood, for these things were of no value to the gory. Milab and Merabak, as it happened, were riding at the rear. They had lagged behind, somewhat against their will, since the camel ridden by Milab had gone lame from a stone bruise, and thus, by good fortune, they evaded the ghoulish onset. Pausing aghast, they beheld the fate of their companions, whose resistance was overcome with horrible quickness. The gory, however, did not perceive Milab and Merabak, being wholly intent on devouring the camels and merchants they had dragged down, as well as those members of their own band that were wounded by the swords and lances of the travelers. The two brothers, leveling their spears, would have ridden forward to perish bravely and uselessly with their fellows, but, terrified by the hideous tumult, by the odor of blood and the hyena-like scent of the gory, their dromedaries balked and bolted, carrying them back along the route into Yoros. During this unpremeditated flight, they soon saw another band of the Gori, who had appeared far off on the southern slopes, and were running to intercept them. To avoid this new peril, Milab and Merabak turned their camels into a side ravine. Traveling slowly because of the lameness of Milab's dromedary, and thinking to find the swift Gori on their heels at any moment, they went eastward for many miles with the sun lowering behind them, and came at mid-afternoon to the low and rainless watershed of that immemorial region. Here they looked out over a sunken plain, wrinkled and eroded, where the white walls and domes of some innominate city gleamed. It appeared to Malab and Merabak that the city was only a few leagues away deeming they had sighted some hidden town of the outer sands, and hopeful now of escaping their pursuers, they began the descent of the long slope toward the plain. For two days, on a powdery terrain that was like the bituminous dust of mummies, they traveled toward the ever-receding domes that had seemed so near. Their plight became desperate, for between them they possessed only a handful of dried apricots and a water bag that was three-fourths empty. Their provisions, together with their stock of jewels and carvings, had been lost with the pack dromedaries of the caravan. Apparently there was no pursuit from the gory, but about them there gathered the red demons of thirst, the black demons of hunger. On the second morning, Malab's camel refused to rise, and would not respond either to the cursing of its master or the prodding of his spear. Thereafter, the two shared the remaining camel, riding together or by turns. Often they lost sight of the gleaming city, which appeared and disappeared like a mirage. But an hour before sunset on the second day, they followed the far-thrown shadows of broken obelisks and crumbling watchtowers into the olden streets. The place had once been a metropolis, but now many of its lordly mansions were scattered shards or heaps of downfallen blocks. Great dunes of sand had poured in through proud triumphal arches, had filled the pavements and courtyards. Lurching with exhaustion and sick at heart with the failure of their hope, Malab and Merabak went on searching everywhere for some well or cistern that the long desert years had happily spared. In the city's heart, where the walls of temples and lofty buildings of state still served as a barrier to the engulfing sand, they found the ruins of an old aqueduct, leading to cisterns dry as furnaces. There were dust-choked fountains in the marketplaces, but nowhere was there anything to betoken the presence of water. Wandering hopelessly on, they came to the ruins of a huge edifice, which, it appeared, had been the palace of some forgotten monarch. The mighty walls, defying the erosion of ages, were still extant. The portals, 
guarded on either hand by green brazen images of mythic heroes, still frowned with unbroken arches. Mounting the marble steps, the jewelers entered a vast roofless hall where cyclopean columns towered as if to bear up the desert sky. The broad pavement flags were mounded with debris of arches and architraves and pilasters. At the hall's far extreme, there was a dais of black-veined marble on which, presumably, a royal throne had once reared. Nearing the dais, Milab and Merabak both heard a low and indistinct gurgling, as of some hidden stream or fountain that appeared to rise from underground depths below the palace pavement. Eagerly trying to locate the source of the sound, they climbed the dais. Here a huge block had fallen from the wall above, perhaps recently, and the marble had cracked beneath its weight, and a portion of the dais had broken through into some underlying vault, leaving a dark and jagged aperture. It was from this opening that the water-like regurgitation rose, incessant and regular as the beating of a pulse. The jewelers leaned above the pit and peered down into webby darkness shot with a doubtful glimmering that came from an indiscernible source. They could see nothing. A dank and musty odor touched their nostrils like the breath of some long-sealed reservoir. It seemed to them that the steady fountain-like noise was only a few feet below in the shadows, a little to one side of the opening. Neither of them could determine the depth of the vault. After a brief consultation, they returned to their camel, which was waiting stolidly at the palace entrance, and removing the camel's harness, they knotted the long reins and leather body bands into a single thong that would serve them in lieu of a rope. Going back to the dais, they secured one end of this thong to the fallen block, and lowered the other into the dark pit. Malab descended, hand over hand, into the depths for ten or twelve feet, before his toes encountered a solid surface. Still gripping the thong cautiously, he found himself on a level floor of stone. The day was fast waning beyond the palace walls, but a wan glimmer was afforded by the hole in the pavement above and the outlines of a half-open door, sagging at a ruinous angle, were revealed at one side by the feeble twilight that entered the vault from unknown crypts or stairs beyond. While Merabak came nimbly down to join him, Malab peered about for the source of the water-like noise. Before him, in the undetermined shadows, he discerned the dim and puzzling contours of an object that he could liken only to some enormous clepsydra or fountain surrounded with grotesque carvings. The light seemed to fail momently. Unable to decide the nature of the object, and having neither torch nor candle, he tore a strip from the hem of his hempen burnous and lit the slow burning cloth and held it aloft at arm's length before him. By the dull, smoldering luminance thus obtained, the jewelers beheld more clearly the thing that bulked prodigious and monstrous, rearing above them from the fragment-littered floor to the shadowy roof. The thing was like some blasphemous dream of a mad devil. Its main portion, or body, was urn-like in form, and was pedestaled on a queerly tilted block of stone at the vault's center. It was palish and pitted, with innumerable small apertures, from its bosom and flattened base, many arm-like and leg-like projections trailed in swollen nightmare segments to the ground, and two other members, sloping tautly, reached down like roots into an open and seemingly empty sarcophagus of gilded metal, graven with weird archaic ciphers that stood beside the block. The urn-shaped torso was endowed with two heads. One of these was beaked like a cuttlefish, and was lined with long oblique slits where the eye should have been. The other head, in close juxtaposition on the narrow shoulders, was that of an aged man, dark and regal and terrible, whose burning eyes were like ballast rubies, and whose grizzled beard had grown to the length of jungle moss on the loathsomely porous trunk. 
This trunk, on the side below the human head, displayed a faint outline as of ribs, and some of the members ended in human hands and feet, or possessed anthropomorphic jointings. Through heads, limbs, and body, there ran recurrently the mysterious noise of regurgitation that had drawn Milab and Merabak to enter the vault. At each repetition of the sound, a slimy dew exuded from the monstrous pores and rilled sluggishly down in endless drops. The jewelers were held speechless and immobile by a clammy terror. Unable to avert their gaze, they met the baleful eyes of the human head, glaring upon them from its unearthly eminence. Then, as the hempen strip in the lab's fingers burned slowly away, and failed to a red smolder, and darkness gathered again in the vault. They saw the blind slits in the other head open gradually, pouring forth a hot, yellow, intolerably flaming light as they expanded to immense round orbits. At the same time, they heard a singular drum-like throbbing, as if the heart of the huge monster had become audible. They knew only that a strange horror not of earth, or but partially of earth, was before them. The sight deprived them of thought and memory. Least of all did they remember the storyteller in Farad, and the tale he told concerning the hidden tomb of Usaru and Neoth Korgai, and the prophecy of the tomb's finding by those who should come to it unaware. Swiftly, with a dreadful stretching and straightening, the monster lifted its foremost members, ending in the brown shriveled hands of an old man, and reached out toward the jewelers. From the cuttlefish beak there issued a shrill demonian cackling. From the mouth of the kingly greybeard head a sonorous voice began to utter words of solemn cadence, like some enchanter's rune in a tongue unknown to Malab and Marabak. They recoiled before the abhorrently groping hands, in a frenzy of fear and panic, by the streaming light of its incandescent orbs, they saw the anomaly rise and lumber forward from its stone seat, walking clumsily and uncertainly on its ill-assorted members. There was a trampling of elephantine pads, and a stumbling of human feet inadequate to bear up their share of the blasphemous hulk. The two stiffly sloping tentacles were withdrawn from the gold sarcophagus, their ends muffled by empty, jewel-sewn cloths of a precious purple, such as would be used for the winding of some royal mummy. With a ceaseless and insane cackling, a malign thundering as of curses that broke to senile quavers, the double-headed horror leaned toward Malab and Marabak. Turning, they ran wildly across the room, before them, illumined now by the pouring rays from the monster's orbits, they saw the half-open door of somber metal, whose bolts and hinges had rusted away, permitting it to sag inward. The door was of cyclopean height and breadth, as if designed for beings huger than man. Beyond it were the dim reaches of a twilight corridor. Five paces away from the doorway, there was a faint red line, that followed the chamber's confirmation on the dusty floor. Merabak, a little ahead of his brother, crossed the line. As if checked in mid-air by some invisible wall, he faltered and stopped. His limbs and body seemed to melt away beneath the burnous. The burnous itself became tattered as with incalculable age. Dust floated on the air in a tenuous cloud and there was a momentary gleaming of white bones where his outflung hands had been. Then the bones, too, were gone, and an empty heap of rags lay rotting on the floor. A faint odor, as of corruption, rose to the nostrils of Milab. Uncomprehending, he had checked his own flight for an instant. Then, on his shoulders, he felt the grasp of slimy withered hands, the cackling and muttering of the heads was like a demon chorus behind him. The drum-like beating, the noise of rising fountains, were loud in his ears. With one swiftly dying scream, he followed Merabak over the red line. 
the enormity that was both man and star-born monster, the nameless amalgam of an unearthly resurrection, still lumbered on and did not pause. With the hands of that Osaro, who had forgotten his own enchantment, it reached for the two piles of empty rags. Reaching, it entered the zone of death and dissolution, which Osaro himself had established to guard the vault for ever. For an instant, on the air, there was a melting as of misshapen cloud, a falling as of light ashes. After that, the darkness returned, and with the darkness, silence. Night settled above that nameless land, that forgotten city, and with its coming, the gory, who had followed Milab and Merabak over the desert plain. Swiftly, they slew and ate the camel that waited patiently at the palace entrance. Later, in the old hall of columns, they found the opening in the dais through which the jewelers had descended. Hungrily, they gathered about the hole, sniffing at the tomb beneath. Then, baffled, they went away, their keen nostrils telling them that the scent was lost, that the tomb was empty, either of life or death.